the new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning around. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from federaljack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition. It is Friday, August 8th, 2014. Tonight's live edition of DTRH, I'm going to be getting into uh, a different topic. I like to change gears up once in a while. You know I like to talk about politics, and I'm... I'm uh, and and I, I do analysis of uh, what's going on, geopolitics, the news, and things like that, events. But from time to time, I like to shift gears a little bit and get into other things that pique my interest. And it also helps you understand the sometimes um, some background information about things. In, in, in this case tonight, we're going to be talking about serial killers and... Um, That'll help you at least understand somewhat the psychopathy of the very people that become politicians. Most, most of them have the same type of thinking and the same lack of remorse for human beings. Anyway, since I'm, I'm normally talking about politics and all that, uh, tonight I want to focus on another uh, interesting topic, and that would be serial killers. Now, in order to do this topic justice, I'm going to have to do multiple broadcasts on this. And I, I plan on it, but to start off with, to pique your interest in this, this is something I've been researching since I was a teenager, uh, I wanted to bring on an author that I heard recently on, uh, it was an archived interview he did, if I remember correctly, it's from back in May, on uh, Coast to Coast, and I had stumbled across it uh, looking for some serial killer documentaries and stuff one night on YouTube just to see if there was anything out there new that I haven't seen yet or uh, you know, maybe some more information for me to gobble up about three o'clock in the morning. And I stumbled across this interview and uh, I was just blown away by the information by the end of the broadcast. And, uh, I, I know that there are a lot of people that might say, well, I don't know, you know, a lot of what he says, you know, could be, he's connecting a lot of murders and stuff to, to one individual, but there's, uh, I, I gotta tell you, this is not, um, this is not just somebody sitting in their basement connecting the dots and coming and saying, hey, Popeye, can I come on your show? Uh, this is a retired detective, and he was a, he was a police detective, uh, or sergeant of detectives, I should say, uh, for a long time. And he retired back in 2005. I'm going to read you his bio in a second, but this isn't some dude sitting in his basement, you know, in his mom's basement with um, 
a tinfoil hat on his head coming up when trying to connect the dots where there aren't dots. This is a seasoned veteran investigator, a professional, someone who did this for a living. He's, he's brought people to justice. I mean, he's a cold case detective. He, he knows what he's talking about. You know, you, you can't, not that somebody in their basement couldn't connect the dots, but that's easily attacked by people saying, oh, they're not a professional, whereas here you have a professional connecting the dots. Uh, and some of the stuff that, you know, he presents, it, it, it can be, I guess, a little frustrating to those that might think they have the answer already. But uh, as I've said to everybody, don't let your emotions connect you to a preconceived notion, Okay. Allow, if new facts come to light, allow the evidence to speak for itself. So that being said, I'm going to allow the evidence to speak for itself. We're going to talk about one of the most prolific serial killers. If, if, if what my guest tonight, John A. Cameron, has discovered is true, and I, I don't have any reason to not believe his work, and I, of course, I have questions. But if what he has has discovered here and presented is true, and the uh, police departments across the nation can act upon this and get into it further, and do these investigations and see if they can can you know connect it uh, through the, the 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 proper legal channels or whatever, and get it on record that yes, he's connected to these murders. This man will be known as uh, I would say one of the most prolific, if not the most prolific, serial killer. He had been killing since he was 11 years old, and they didn't catch him until he was in his 70s. That's amazing. Usually they catch the, they, they catch the killers long before that. Uh, the fact that this guy was out there for so long doing this just makes you wonder exactly how many people he actually did kill. But anyway, I don't want to waste any more time. Let me read you a little bit about my guest tonight, and then I want to bring him up because I don't want to waste any more time. I want to get right into this because th this is going to, I know the two hours is going to fly right by. I, I spent the past week going over his book and uh, you have to get it, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, you, you definitely have to get his book. You can go to coldcasecameron.com. Coldcasecameron.com is his website. And the book title is It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, The Serial Killer You Never Heard Of. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. If you're into this, you really won't be disappointed. Anyway, my guest tonight is John A. Cameron. He's a 53-year-old retired police detective from Great Falls, Montana. His career in law enforcement began in 1979. He retired in 2005 as a sergeant of detectives, working cold cases. He has worked on FBI serial killer task forces, been featured on America's Most Wanted, Dateline, NBC, and he helped produce a series known as Most Evil on True TV back in 2010. Or, excuse me. Uh, in 2010, while working as an analyst for the Montana Board of Pardons and Parole in Deer Lodge Prison, Montana, he was in a position to access information that had been kept secret for 55 years, unraveling the most intelligent serial killer ever. I promise you, after tonight's broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to be interested enough to get his book. I urge you to purchase the book. Get it. Do the research. Once you read the book, cover to cover, don't just come up with assumptions or just read the book and then go to his website. And it, the website itself is an addendum to the book. Uh, and we're going to get into that and more. Anyway, let's get to my guest. Welcome to the broadcast, John. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thank you, Popeye, for having me on. This is an important story to tell to the whole nation. So I'm glad you contacted me to ask me to be on. I appreciate it. Uh, well, I, I, I respect. Uh, I was a uh, a private investigator. I was never a law enforcement officer myself. I was in the Coast Guard. I, was, I did federal law enforcement, and I did. Uh, I was a private investigator for uh, a couple years, and I did investigations and stuff, but nothing, uh, you know, to this magnitude. But between being a an investigator myself of sorts, and uh, doing investigative journalism, and then having this interest in serial killers. When I came across uh, your interview that you did on Coast to Coast, I was just blown away because, I mean, like I said to you, I went back and listened to the interview four or five times before I called you because my, my jaw was on the floor because you were able to connect this guy, Edward Wayne Edwards, that I've never uh, even heard of, to a lot of these different murders, uh, some of them very famous. And, you know, it, it, it blew my mind because here, you know, I could say, again, well, if I wanted to be a skeptic, well, this guy, he's just an author. You know, Maybe he's just trying to sell a book. But here you are, a seasoned cold case detective. You've worked 
on task forces going after serial killers. So you, this is this is not you know I mean it, not that someone you know independently couldn't do it an author, but it just goes to show you that that disparaging thinking has to go away. I mean, here you are a seasoned professional and the information you're bringing is, it's like dropping atomic bombs of information. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to give you the floor. Uh, I'll start with this. What got you interested in Edward Wayne Edwards, considering, like you said, the serial killer you've never heard of? Sure. Let me tell you a little bit about me and how I became to get involved with him. Uh, I'm a retired police detective from Great Falls, Montana. I did 24 years here and specialized in cold cases. And when I retired, I went to work in Deer Lodge Prison, Montana for the parole board. And my job was to interview inmates that were uh, asking for parole and analyze them, uh, dig up their records, interview them, and then make a recommendation as to whether they were worthy of a parole. But in this position in June of 2010, I was notified about a serial killer back in Ohio named Edward Wayne Edwards, and he was 77 years old in June of 2010 when I first heard of him. He had just been caught for his first murder and was confessing to five murders in June of 2010 in Ohio and Wisconsin, and those five murders spanned a 20-year period of time. And so uh, a memo went out to any communities in the United States that might have unsolved double murders, uh, particularly back in the 50s and 60s, because Edwards had apparently ran the country back in the 50s and 60s as an escaped criminal and committed a rash of uh, robberies. But now in 2010, when he's being identified as a serial killer, uh, they wanted everybody to look back and see if they could put him in their towns uh, during any killings. And uh, being a retired cold case detective, I had an unsolved double murder that happened on New Year's of 1956. And in that case, a young woman and man were parked on the banks of the Sun River in a car and were approached by someone dressed like a police officer with a flashlight. And he ordered them out of the car and he forced the girl to tie the boy up with the belt. Then he put the boy on his knees and executed him in the head. And he kidnapped the girl, and uh, then he terrorized her for several hours and then took her to the top of the highest point in town and put her on her knees and executed her and got away with murder. In uh, 1956, the case never got unsolved. never got solved. But in June of 2010, when the memo came out, I was able to tie Edwards to Great Falls at the time of the murder because I worked in Deer Lodge Prison and had access to his criminal records and prove that he had actually been here and fled right after the murder and got away with it. So that's how I first got introduced to Edward Edwards is he was confessing to five murders. I had an unsolved murder. I connected him to it and decided to confront him with a letter to see if he'd confess. So we know for a fact on the books right now that he's got five murders on him, correct? Yep, five murders spanning 20 years. Okay, and that's what that's what he's legally on the you know on the books with the legal system got charged for. But how how many would you say? And we're I mean we're we're gonna dive deep into this. But how many would you say, in your estimation, from the time you started investigating this till now, um, do you think he killed in reality? Well, when you look back at at how he worked um, in nineteen. 19- or in 2009, when he finally got caught in 2010, when he finally confessed to the five murders, four of those murders were very similar to the 1956 Great Falls murder. That is, they were couples who were kidnapped, stabbed, tortured, shot, um, just just horrible. And they were kind of like Lover's Lane's killings um, from 1977 and 1980. So he confessed to those to get his death penalty in 2010, and they matched the murder that I had in 56. So I knew that he'd been killing from 1956 until 2010 when he's finally confessing. And uh, so I uh, went back, actually, to the very beginning of his life and spent the last four years documenting the entire investigation, interviewing his wives, children. And the number of people he killed will be in the hundreds, if not over a thousand. Wow. Just... Wow. The fact that this guy was killing from the time he was 11 years old 
And uh, well, actually, didn't isn't there? Uh, I think his mother was killed, right? His mother was shot in the stomach. Was that done by him, or was that done just in his presence? That's a very important part about what happened to him. He was born in 1933. That's the height of the Great Depression. And uh, he was born in Ohio, near the Cleveland area. And he was raised by an aunt and uncle until the age of five. And that aunt and uncle always told him that they were his parents. But what actually was true was that he was conceived in the backseat of a car. He never knew his father. He never knew his mother. And when he was five years old, this woman comes out of prison, and she's introduced to his mother for the first time. The aunt and uncle abandon him give him to the mother, the height of the Great Depression. It's 1938 now. He's five years old. She dies of a suspicious gunshot wound to her stomach in August of 1938 and lives a period of six days in the house and then finally dies. And his name is changed right after the shooting. He was originally born Charles Edward Myers. And after the shooting of his mother, he's placed in a Catholic orphanage his name has changed to Edward Wayne Edwards. He's beat, raped, beat by the nuns, molested by the older boys, and by age 11 escapes Parmadale Catholic Orphanage and starts committing what he would call the rest of his life crimes of recognition. And what he meant by that were murders that would shock the conscience and be so horrific that they would live in infamy and everybody would talk about him for the rest of their lives. And that's what he started doing at age 11. And the fact that he was able to do this until he was in his 70s uh, is incredible. Uh, and, you know, we're going we're gonna to cover the span here. So let's start off with his first couple of murders. When he was 11 years old, I mean, to, to think that an 11-year-old could kill, uh, for me, it, it doesn't um, go beyond the pale because I understand... I, you know, doing researching this stuff since I was a teenager, uh, well over 20 years now, I, uh, you know, I've come to an understanding that kids can be just as evil as adults. I mean, I have a book called Lust Mord. If you've never read it, get it, you know, I, I suggest go ahead and grab a copy. It's cheap on Amazon. It's called Lust Mord, The Writings and Artifacts of Murderers. And it's their journals, the things they wrote when they were in prison, you know, some of their confessions, whatever. And, some of the stuff, I mean, some of these people that were involved were little kids. I think one little girl was like nine or ten years old, and she would lure little boys out into the woods and then kill them uh, with like a rock to the head and then mutilate them by cutting off their penises. And she was like, again, nine or ten years old. So the fact that he started at the age of 11 to some people might be shocking, but it's actually, it, 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 as strange as this sounds, it happens more often than you would think. I'll, I'll put it that way. So go ahead, John. He starts off with his first kill at the age of 11. Yeah, by, by the age of 11, um, it's 1945, and he escapes the, uh, the, the orphanage, and he goes to Chicago, where he breaks into the homes of two women sleeping, one in June and one in December of 1945, beats them in the face, stabs them, shoots them, and then writes messages on the wall, uh, very childish messages stating, please stop me, I can't control myself, um, and then his next victim is a little six-year-old girl in January of 1946 named Suzanne Dignan, who is sleeping in her house while her parents are there. He lures her out of the house, takes her to a nearby basement where he dismembers her, beheads her, and then spreads her remains around the streets of Chicago in 1946, taunting the police with anonymous letters, phone calls, and very immaturish writings. Uh, challenging them to catch him. And it's clearly all uh, written by a very uh, immaturish person writing it. Well, it turns out that the little girl that was killed in 1946, her father was in charge of the funding of the Parmadale Catholic Orphanage that Ed, uh, Edwards had escaped. And he targeted him specifically for that reason, for his horrible abuse he uh, lived through in uh, Cleveland Parmadale Catholic Orphanage. And uh, that case was known as the Lipstick Killings. And a man named William Heron was arrested eventually in uh, June of 1946 for that killing and confessed. 
and then recant it immediately, but then spent 66 years in prison called the Lipstick Killer. And that was Edwards' first setup. And that would be his MO the rest of his life, would be to kill somebody, create a horrific murder, taunt the police with false letters, phone calls, false evidence, and set up an innocent person, lead the evidence to them, and then watch the system kill for him. And so he just started that at, in 1945, 46, and he did it every year, every decade, up until his capture in 2009. And and to think that a an eleven year old child is smart enough to uh, and mature enough to 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 actually do this. Uh, and again, people say I just don't buy it. But I'm telling you, if you actually do the research on serial killers, you will see that these evil kids usually end up having uh, a very high IQ, and they're just they end up maturing. And I don't want to say they're fully matured, but they end up maturing to a certain extent uh, much faster than other children their age, and they're able to to have these thoughts. Uh, what, I mean, I don't. it doesn't mean I agree and that it's a great thing and we should all high-five and be kumbaya about it, but it's the reality of the situation. It sounds scary, but it's just, you know, unless you research this or you watch true crime and stuff like that or investigate Discovery or any of those type of, uh, you know, networks or anything, you're not going to really know this stuff. But it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, a child of 11 years old was able to do that. Now, a question about his M.O., because you mentioned that his M.O. was to, to frame other people. It's interesting that, unlike other killers, uh, a lot of times serial killers have a certain M.O. that they do how they do the kills themselves. It's almost like a, a, a certain ritual that they have to go through uh, time after time. Once in a while, um, they'll, uh, it'll metamorphosis and perhaps grow I, I, in an upper direction, it'll never devolve. It'll always evolve into whatever more evil, sadistic thing. Uh, but it's interesting how his MO wasn't so much with the killing itself, but creating these horrific murders and then more so getting other people to take the fall for it. Uh, it's, that's interesting because that's, that's more guile than um, some of these other killers that are more more so monsters. Not that this guy wasn't a monster, but there's this sick, twisted intelligence there. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's, that's exactly what he had. And he, he was so different from most serial killers because most of them have some type of a sexual addiction, a violence addiction, something that gets them caught eventually. Edwards didn't have that. His addiction was the kill itself and the recognition. And what I, what I, keep repeating that word recognition is because he repeated it throughout his life and every interview he gave, and he gave thousands of them to the media over the years, that he was into crime for recognition. And what that meant was to commit a horrific murder and be able to wake up on any given day and open up the paper and there's your murder on the pages that the cops and nobody knows who they're looking for, but they're pinning it on an innocent guy and he gets to sit back and watch that. And then when those jurisdictions would would uh, convict innocent people, he would return and kill again and see if they'd do it again. And many places did it again and again and again. And some of the states where he did his most prolific killing were Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Texas. And that's because those states put people to death more than anyone else. And he knew that. And he used that his whole life to... Uh, to see if he could get officials to go out there and some people, and uh, he he did it everywhere. To me, that type of thinking, that level of intelligence, um, like the way, like his that mo is actually, uh, I, I guess it's actually a bit more scarier. I don't know if that's the right word than some of these guys that are just monsters. Because not only was this guy a monster, but he was a highly intelligent monster. You know, like he he obviously had a, a decently high IQ. Did was he ever uh, IQ tested? Do you know if uh, he had? I, I actually, I think I, I think I've heard you mention that he was IQ tested. Something uh, the the high one thirties, I think, right? Yeah, nineteen forty five. Actually, he was giving a series of tests just before he was uh, released from the orphanage to go home for Christmas, and uh, they showed that he had an IQ of one hundred thirty two that he was diagnosed a sadomasochist already, that he had a deep dislike for older people, and he was very conflicted over his mother 
who was his mother, who was his father, and he had an identity crisis. And so his whole life, he used his intelligence to outsmart people. And in many of the cases where he wrote letters, many serial killers will write their journals and they'll keep them secret. But Edwards would actually write his journals and publish them. And I think your listeners need to know that this man, when he was 36 years old, published a book, a 460-page book, autobiography on his life, claiming that he was a reformed criminal in 1972, that he used to be a bad guy, and now he's a happily married family man with five kids. But this book ended up being an entire puzzle of murder by a serial killer. And if you don't mind, I should read the cover for your listeners. No, uh, actually, um, go was, ahead. If uh, it, we got about 30 seconds till we go to break, but go ahead. Okay, the book is titled Metamorphosis of a Criminal, and it states he was on the FBI's list of the 10 most wanted criminals. He was a holdup man, a bank robber, a dangerous character, and he spent 14 years in five jails. Now he is a writer, a respected citizen, and the head of a family of five. Metamorphosis of a Criminal, the true Ed Edwards story. And this book ended up being a puzzle of murder by a serial killer of 23 years of murder back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Talk about the gall on this guy. He actually wrote a book about himself. And uh, as John was telling me off air, that was actually a key to helping him as a detective. Again, he's a seasoned cold case detective, ladies and gentlemen. All those shows you see on TV, we're actually talking to a real cold case detective here. Okay? And he was able to use this guy's book to connect him to multiple murders. Stay tuned. Break sneaking up. Three short minutes. Don't go anywhere. Coldcasecameron.com is the website. Go get the book. You won't be disappointed. Stay tuned. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. So when John and I got interrupted, we were uh, getting into Edwards' own book. This guy was... I mean, talk about the ego in this guy. He actually wrote a book about himself, about, oh, I'm a reformed criminal all the while. Uh, he's not a reformed criminal. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, there's so much information in this book, a two-hour broadcast isn't going to do it justice. It's really not. Uh, a three- or four-hour broadcast wouldn't do it justice. What you need to do, and look, if you're into this, if you're into researching serial killers and true crime and stuff, I promise you this will be, the book's worth it. Go to coldcasecameron.com. Go pick up the book. The title is It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, The Serial Killer You Never Heard Of. You can also pick it up on Amazon. They're, they're hardcover editions right now. I'm sure the Kindle ones are coming, and I'll let John answer that uh, in a second. But you, you can get the hardcover right now. Grab a copy of it, read the book, and then use the website, coldcasecameron.com, as the addendum to it. Uh, I think it's interesting that, you know, even though John will say that he's, you know, a cop, not so much an author. The author thing came second, right? Uh, the fact that he put up an addendum to go with it, uh, I find that interesting. Not many authors do that. So I, I find it uh, unique, at least in from a researcher's aspect, that not only do you have the book, but then there's this website itself that you can go to and use as an addendum, and there's more pictures and stuff available and other things up there. So anyway, getting back, I want to pick John's brain. So, John, you were saying that... Um, this book that Edwards wrote, uh, and I'll, I'll let you throw the name out there again because um, I totally forgot it, but this book was a key to you being able to connect him to you know, being in the same places as a lot of these other murders that happened uh, going back uh, throughout time. So what was the title of the book again? And then I guess my first question about the book is when you read the book, were you – did your jaw hit the floor? I mean, were you astonished that you were actually able to sit there and go, bam, 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 you know, like one after the other? And he actually himself, it wasn't like you're coming up with this. He himself puts himself in these very cities and areas at the time of a lot of these murders, correct? Yeah, that's right. It was actually the book that the Homeland Security Department used to issue the memo out to the cities for unsolved homicides in 2010 because Edwards actually detailed his documentation of his life of travels from the time he was born until the time he was 68, or uh, 1968, when he came out of Leavenworth Prison, claiming to be a reformed criminal. And that's when he wrote this book, Metamorphosis of a Criminal, it's called, The True Life Story of Ed Edwards. 
And what it should have been called is metamorphosis of a killer, because that's what it ended up being. As soon as I saw that he wrote the book and they were looking at him for a double murder, possibly in my area, I bought the book and I couldn't believe what I read in there. He placed himself in Great Falls in 1956 at the time of our double murder. And here he was confessing uh, 40 years later after writing the book to the same types of murders. And that in itself was a jaw dropper. But after reading the book, I couldn't believe how it unraveled the puzzle. He, If you had taken his NCIC criminal records, which I had access to, and the book, and just followed his life of arrest up until 1968, and follow his life in his book, it revealed the murders he had done in cities all over, every part of the United States, 1945 until 1968. And he came to my hometown, married a gal, uh, kidnapped her, and took her all over the United States in 1955 and 56, creating these horrific ritual murders all over, and forcing her to drive the car as he would change into his uniform or portray himself as a preacher or portray himself as a doctor of psychiatry. Those were his three ruses. He would be a married family man, doctor of psychiatry, preacher, and a police officer. And he had all the credentials to uh, prove that he was someone other than he was and that he was those positions. So he, he got his victims to come to him. That's just insane that this guy was... I mean, this is in the 50s, and he was at that level where he had costumes, uh, IDs. I mean, this is stuff that you would think would only be you know, going on today with the technology um, and the level of thinking that we have today. And yet, here you have, back in the 50s, this was going on. I mean, again, that's why I say... I think, and I said this to you off air, uh, if he was tested when he was a kid and his IQ was 132 as a child... I'm willing to bet that by the time he was in his 70s, his IQ, if they had tested him, probably – okay, maybe if he was getting older and he maybe start losing brain cells, I'll say we'll, we'll test him in his like 40s, right, like midlife, 45. I'm willing to bet that he probably would have had an IQ somewhere around uh, mid-140s, easily 150 because this is a higher level of thinking the way he was operating. I mean just his, his MO alone – blows me away that as i said most serial killers you know like you said they they a lot of times they, they do it for the the sexual thrill and they have a specific um routine that they do over and over and over again and this guy was just different i mean he just did it you know he did it for the murder but also for the notoriety which we, we can get into the notoriety thing in hour two i have a, a couple questions about that so He's he's running around with this woman in the fifties. Did he eventually kill this woman? I, I I don't think he would have let her go because then obviously she would have ratted and you know ratted him out and he would have been in jail, right? So I'm assuming he killed her. No, well, actually, what happened is in October of 1955, he met this um, his wife that he came to Great Falls with in '56, and her name uh, was Jeanette, and she was from Idaho Falls, and she was just 18 years old, pretty uh, naive. He kidnapped her, basically. He raped her. He got her pregnant and forced her to drive around the country while he committed these murders. And then he ended up in my hometown where he committed a robbery and fled and got caught uh, 200 miles away. And she was with him. And they were both under assumed name. He was Dr. James Garfield Langley, and she was the wife with who was pregnant at the time. So that was the ruse. They were in a stolen car. Um... He got arrested and went to Deer Lodge Prison. But during the interview of his arrest, he did not allow the police officers to talk to his wife back in the 50s because uh, back then you could do that. There was no such thing as Miranda warning. There was no such thing as you know, the court system we have now. And a wife can't testify against the husband. So he knew that. So that was, that's why he always was married when he was killing. And his woman was the ruse. And he ended up in Deer Lodge Prison. She ended up having a baby here in Great Falls in August of 1956, and then divorced him and uh, never got questioned at all about their exploits until 2011 when I arrived in Idaho Falls and found her down there. And uh, it was a pretty devastating interview for her because she had never told her son who was born here who, her father, who the father was, and uh, she had actually been forced to partake in some of the crimes. 
Wow. So when you reached out to her, was that actual first time that she had ever opened her mouth and told anybody and spoken aloud what she had witnessed and partaken in with him all those years ago? Yes. The only other time that she had ever spoken to law enforcement about him was uh, in 1959. He was released by the Montana Board of Pardons and Parole, and that's who I worked for in 2010. He was released on parole to Oregon. And he had gone out to Oregon, and he killed a couple there in 1960 and then escaped the uh, Portland County Jail and uh, became America's Most Wanted in 1961. And the police came to her to warn her that uh, he was on the run. But they never questioned her. And it turns out there was a reason why the FBI never questioned him, is that's because Edwards was an informant from 1950 all the way up until his capture for law enforcement all over the place. He would uh, inform on his own murders under assumed identities and lead the evidence to innocent people. And it worked over and over again. Wow. Again, this this goes to show you a, a level of intelligence that's, it's yes, again, the monster itself is scary, but I think what's also scary is the level of intelligence and the, the, the way this guy operated. Obviously, he was on a, a complete different wavelength than uh, the, the rest of the human beings around him. Uh, just in- incredible, and the through his book, you were able to connect him to a lot of things, and through your research into him, since you learned about him and started researching him, you were able to connect him to some pretty um, high-profile cases. Now, you, you say that you're able to connect him to things like the Black Dahlia murders, the Zodiac murders, and the John Bonet Ramsey murders. So let's start off with Black Dahlia, since uh, she's the oldest of all of this. He would have had to have been around 14, right, at the the time of her murder? Yeah, he was 13 and a half years old. And you're able to connect him to her murder. Explain for the listeners, you know, in as much detail as you want. And again, ladies and gentlemen... John and I couldn't do this 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 topic justice, and it, I don't. You don't have to believe you know everything that either one of us says or what John talks about or anything. I always urge you to do your own research, but I do urge you if you're going to do the research, then at least get the reference material, which would be his book, and then use his website coldcasecameron.com as a reference because I know you have uh, more pictures and stuff up there too that go along with. Uh, the book. So I urge all the listeners, if you do purchase the book, use the website as an addendum to it while you're researching this. So again, Black Dahlia, if he's 13 and a half years old when she's murdered, how did he do that? How is he connected to her murder? Well, let me start with how, how it got to there, because the Black Dahlia murder never came into the investigation until two years into it. And for your listeners that don't know who she is, that was Elizabeth Short, and she was uh, cut in two on January 15th, 1947, and laid out in a public lot down in Los Angeles. Um, she was a beautiful 22-year-old gal, uh, act-inspired actress, and uh, somebody cut her in two pieces and laid her out in a public parking lot in 1947. Never was solved. It was kind of one of the biggest cases ever um, over the decades. But after I found Edwards had uh, written this book, connected into the double murder here in Great Falls. Um, I took the book and I tore it apart and I turned it into a PDF file so that the phrasing in the book could be searched on the Internet. Because the important thing about Edwards was he was an author. He was a publisher. He appeared in movies. He wrote his own album. And he also authored his own websites as he got older in life. And his book was a puzzle, but so was every movie appearance, radio appearance, or anything he appeared on. And he appeared in thousands of places. You can see quite a few of them on my website, coldcasecameron.com, if you go to the timeline and just look at what he did to his life. But it was the book, Metamorphosis of a Criminal, that led me to the Black Dahlia case and, uh, and to a website that eventually Edwards published in 2002. And that website was called blackdahliasolution.org. And it really ended up being the Black Dahlia Solution. And it was authored by Ed Edwards. And the beginning of how I tied him to that through the phrasing in the book was he placed himself in Los Angeles at the time of the killing and 13 years old. And just I'll read a little portion of what he said. One of the uh, 
things on uh, Edwards' website is the frequently asked questions. And somebody asked him, I am wondering what drew the author to the case, referring to the Black Dahlia case. And he answered, in January of 1947, I was 13 years old. I loved riddles and murder mysteries. I regularly listened to radio programs like Suspense, The Whistler, Lights Out, and Inner Sanctum, and I was impressionable. On January 16, 1947, I read Fiend Tortures Kills Girl Leaves Body in L.A. Lot in the Morning L.A. Examiner. The front page article said that the girl was nude and bisected at the waist. This uh, reading goes on for quite a ways, but what that was was Edwards placing himself in Los Angeles at the age of 13 at the time the Black guy was killed. And then he further connected himself to the killing of six-year-old Suzanne Dignan a year earlier and tied both the Black Dahlia, 1947, and the killing of six-year-old Suzanne Dignan, 1946, to him. And he published it on a website as a puzzle, just like his book. And uh, he killed Joe Manet Ramsey 50 years after he killed little Suzanne Dignan in 1946. And both girls were two little six-year-old girls sleeping in their house at night while their parents slept, um, taken to the basement. Uh, Joan Bonet was threatened to be beheaded, and she practically was, and Suzanne Dignan was beheaded. And uh, those two cases were tied together. They were 50 years apart. Edwards, Edwards is both murders, 1946-1996. And then there's the Zodiac murders and the... The West Memphis Three murders, which I remember the HBO documentary. I was telling you this off air. I remember the HBO documentary Paradise Lost about those murders. I think it aired in '94, if I remember correctly. And I remember seeing it when I was I was like 17 or 18 years old at the time. And this was a couple of years after I had started researching serial killers. And you brought up uh, that Edwards is actually in the video. He's there's a shot of him holding the dollar bill and showing the back of the dollar bill where it says annuit coeptus novus order seclorum and it, you know it's got the um, the all seeing eye uh, and it's it, and of course he was into the occult which we're going to get into too and I have a couple questions about that because um, I have a few questions uh, you know about what you think he might have been connected to and with that as well but that in itself. I found completely mind blowing, and I remember seeing the, the documentary. And then you show a picture of him in the video, and you actually went back and contacted the producers. I think it was of the video, the people that had made it, and they can't account for how this guy got into the video shot. Like why? Did, well, I think it was during while the parents were talking. He 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 comes up in the video shot. I'll let you elaborate on it. It's just, I mean, that that to me is like re- going back to the crime scene, injecting yourself back into it. Now that is the mo of what these serial killers do uh, a lot of times. Some you know, in one way or another, uh, and a lot of times you see other criminals do it as well. So anyway, uh, I'll let you elaborate on that. I just thought it was very interesting that he showed up in the Paradise Lost documentary that HBO put out about the very killings that he did. Well, yeah, let me uh, kind of explain what the West Memphis case is. A lot of people know that and some don't, but that happened in May of 1993 on a full moon night, May 5th, 1993, Cinco de Mayo Day. Three little eight-year-old boys were brought to Robin Hood Hills Park where they were uh, stripped naked, uh, beat severely, uh, tied up in uh, a very ritualistic pattern. Uh, funny star-shaped patterns were stamped on their bodies. One of the boys' penises was removed. And in the end, uh, three teens ended up going down for the crime. Three uh, kids in West Memphis, Arkansas, that dressed in black, basically, were, were said to be Satanists and that they must have done it. And so they got convicted. And HBO followed this whole trial back in uh, 1993, 94, 95, when, when it was going on. And they did a documentary. And there was a scene in the document called Christmas. And it's filmed on December 19th. 1993 in West Memphis, Arkansas. And the scene is the parents of one of the victims, um, the buyer's victim, the buyer's boy. And they're sitting at the grave of their son crying that it's never, Christmas is never going to be the same without their son. 
and suddenly the cameraman chose to take a 10-second shot of an old man standing behind them. He's wearing a hat, a fake beard, and carrying a cane, and holding a $1 bill right into the camera, showing Osiris' eye in the Egyptian pyramid, and then puts the money in his wallet, and the shot ends. Well, the man in the picture ended up being Edward Edwards, and the cane he was holding was actually the weapon that was used to beat the boys to death. You know, as the Zodiac Killer, the Zodiac Killer was always saying he was waiting for a good movie of him. But Edwards had had movies of his murders playing for decades, and his ultimate goal was to get himself injected into his own murder movie, and he did it at Paradise Lost. And that film actually debuted June of 1996, and it would be six months later that he will kill Joan Benet Ramsey after that debuted, 666. He played games with numbers. And he was a Satanist. And he uh, he did these types of ritualistic murders all over. And the West Memphis Three case was actually another replication of a murder he had done just before he came to my hometown in 1956. He had done the same type of murder, three little teens in a park in Chicago. Only that park was Robinson Woods Park. And uh, removed flesh from one of the boys. Uh, laid him out in the sign of the cross and carved a big dipper in the leg of one of them. So 13 years before he actually did the Zodiac killings in 1968, Ed Edwards kidnaps three little boys, strips them naked, ties them up, lays them out in the park in the sign of the cross and carves the big dipper in their leg. That's the type of stuff this man did. And that's what the Zodiac was. The Zodiac was Satan. And he was playing out ritualistic um, ancient Egyptian gods and uh, forcing his victims to play out some of the rituals. And I remember that you mentioned that he had, or, or Jean Benet, uh, I think it was a family friend, uh, she had said something about she gets a, she was going to get a personal visit from Santa Claus on... Uh, on Christmas Day, and the family friend had corrected her and said, no, it's Christmas Eve, and she said, no, my Santa comes on Christmas Day. If you look at the picture of Edwards in the night, in that documentary that HBO did, if you look at his face when he's holding that dollar bill and stuff, and he's doing the twiddly you know, thumbs thing, if you look, he's got a beard, a white beard. And I, I just thought about that while we were talking about the Jean Benet case. I thought, I was thinking, and I was like, you know, I remember he had said that she had mentioned something about a family friend saying that she gets a personal visit from her Santa Claus, and then here you have, you know, you're you're saying that you know six months after the documentary aired is when she was killed, and in the documentary you see he's got this big white beard and he's kind of fat at the time, and he could pass for quote unquote Santa Claus. Yeah, that's exactly what he was doing there. Um, there's Saint Nick. And he's actually wearing the same kind of hat that you see in the picture of Hannibal on the on a lot of the productions. That straw hat. He he was horrible. He was uh, he had gotten himself into that camera shot. And what's even worse is after the shot ends, and you watch the parents lying by the grave, you will see that the production crew actually t- takes the star shaped pattern shadow and will place it direct center of the father's forehead. And the day that that was filmed. The whole intent of Edwards was to try to get that father set up for the murder of his child. And a knife was injected into the scene that day that ended up becoming a very controversial piece during the trial as to how this knife came in, whose knife was it, who brought it in, and the killer was actually right in front of him. But nobody thought that nice little old man sitting at the grave looking like Santa Claus was the killer. So he actually was able to taint the crime scene while they were filming the documentary and almost get the father to be blamed for the murder. Well, to this day, that's, you know, you hear the most vile comments about poor Mr. Byers. I mean, here he had his eight-year-old son kidnapped, tortured, and killed, and the evidence was now being steered to make it look like he did it, which is exactly what happened in Joe Manet Ramsey. That's how Edwards worked. He would always groom his victims months, if not years, sometimes decades, before he killed someone close to him. Get into their family, get, make it look like an inside job, steer the evidence to a parent, and then watch the public and the press and the jury system destroy that innocent person. 
And he did it over and over. And I guess the best example was John and Pat Pugh Ramsey. And I think it's interesting, and we're going to get into this in the second hour, but when you look into a lot of these murders, even if you don't look into Edwards, okay, say people don't want to believe that Edwards was involved, okay, fine. But when you look into a lot of these murders, uh, the occult always comes up. And of course, the occult just means, the word actually means hidden. But um, the dark occult, I should say, comes up. And um, hardcore Satanism seems to pop up. And I think it's interesting because this guy, Edwards, was, for lack of a better term, a student of Aleister Crowley. Uh, as most of you, my, my faithful listeners, know, uh, is referred to as the one of the wickedest men in the world, they call him. And um, he truly was a, a, an evil person, you know, do what thy, was it do what thou wilt, uh, you know, and that, that's the attitude that they, that the powers that shouldn't be put out. And we, we all know that anyway, that's a side, that's side issue. But you can see how this guy was a student of the very same individual that, uh, as I said in the beginning, you know, politicians are psychopaths too, and a lot of them are uh, behind the scenes. And I know some people might find this hard to believe, but they are, they are involved in some of this very high-level Satanism. So I just I find it interesting that this guy was a student of Crowley's. And we got about two minutes before we go to break, but I'll, I'll throw this out, and we could chat about this, and we can get into it in the second hour. But uh, do you think that being a, a hardcore Satanist and, and being whatever – you know, level he was at, whatever he did, uh, obviously he was, he was killing people to a you know, to, uh, perhaps uh, at a certain level that was helping along with his, his, uh, beliefs. But do you think he was part of a much larger cult and that's how he could have had some help? I mean, it is, uh, I know it's a possibility that, you know, cults do work, uh, together in tandem behind the scenes. And they, there are some really bad ones that it's not a bunch of teenagers, you know, uh, worshiping the devil or doing, you know, quote unquote witchcraft in, in the woods, if, you know, at, at night. It, it's actually really there. There are cults that do involve people that you know are doctors, lawyers, and you know, on the street they look like normal everyday uh, average Joe. So I, I just wonder if you think, uh, really quick, if he was part of that at all. Do you think he was connected to anything like that? Well, he was the top dog. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, he had he had people below him, and I actually interviewed one of those people in Deer Lodge Prison, Frank Dryman, um, who Edwards had actually been in prison with in 1956 through 59 in Deer Lodge, and those two were both occultists and were were uh, playing it out in Deer Lodge Prison back then. But Edwards, as for did he have help in his murders? Did anybody? Helped him in his murders and were a witness. They were dead. Um, he probably killed he them. Both I would assume he probably killed them afterwards. I'm yeah. going to cut us off because the break is sneaking up, but we can get back into this question on the other side because this is uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you. So, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. Again, go check out John's book, coldcasecameron.com. Get the book. Bookmark the website. It's an addendum to the book. Look up Edward Wayne Edwards. Interesting to say the least. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. As always, I urge you to go check out the archives over on Federal Jack. All these show archives are over there. I'm a few show bu- shows behind because uh, I've been busy the past few weeks, but I will get everything up to date in the next week or so. Uh, just go over to the download section. You can download anything you want for free, all of the shows, and... Anything I've done on Truth Frequency is also available over on Truth Frequency. Uh, but you can, get, you can get all the older broadcasts going back to when I first uh, did my first radio show and any special podcasts and stuff I did over at Federal Jack. So go check it out. Anyway, I want to get back into what we were talking about because this is an extremely interesting topic. And two hours is not enough time. I don't even think four or five hours is enough time to talk about this. Go to John's website, coldcasecameron.com, coldcasecameron.com. If you're interested in, in true crime, if you research about serial killers, get his book. It's titled It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, The Serial Killer You Never Heard Of. It's available on his website and on Amazon.com. And I know John will be releasing a Kindle version soon, but you know that it takes time to do all that stuff. And I'm sure he's a, a busy man. So go check out the book itself. And I always tell you, look, I have a Kindle e-reader. I love it. My wife got me one for Christmas. I think it's great. I use it for when I have to travel and stuff. But I still have physical copies of every book that I have on that thing. I have a physical copy of it. 
get a physical copy of this book. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. So when we went to break, John, we were talking about uh, Edwards' connection to the dark occult. And um, I had to ask you, you know, I, your, your take really quick because the bumper music was coming up and cutting us off there. The break was sneaking up on us. But um, I had asked you for the listeners that are just joining here in an hour or two. I'd asked John if um, Edwards is the serial killer. Uh, if his connection with the dark occult, if he was connected to any cults themselves, uh, and um, uh, it, it's a, it's not an, it's not a new concept. That this actually uh, is something that you know you, I, at least I've stumbled across. I've seen that there are uh, more of these types of individuals connected to these, uh, you know, uh, cults themselves than you would think. Uh, so that 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 show on um, Fox that they have the following, where it's a cult of serial killers. Or uh, doesn't you know it, that that kind of to a certain extent does ring true, except they kind of portray them to be lost individuals, and a lot of these people that participate in these uh, ceremonies or these these satanic cults are lawyers, doctors, judges, um, you know, police officers, uh, sp- you know, sports players, whatever. A lot of people of uh, quote unquote high stature, and some people in positions of authority, politicians, and uh, time after time when I see connections to the dark occult in a serial killing case, uh, I always wonder uh, if they're connected to a much larger cult. Not that the murders were, but if the the guy, the, the covering up of the murders, uh, so to speak, uh, was was done not just by one individual, but there's certain things that would have to have other individuals involved. Uh, and who better to have involved but your fellow cult members? So uh, when we were getting into the break, I, I had asked John about that, but I'll, I'll let him reiterate because I, I, we got cut off. So John, uh, I know we were talking about it during the break, you and I, but thoughts on that? Well, just I'll give you an example kind of how Edwards and the occult worked. Um, in 1979, 1980, and uh, 81, he killed all of these the little children in Atlanta. He's the real Atlanta child killer. And what he would do in that case is he would portray himself as a police officer. He actually had the uniform. Um, he had a, a relative that lived in Atlanta at the time and was a police sergeant on the police department down there. Um, I've actually got a photograph of him with the captain of the Atlanta police department. But what he would do is kidnap, let's say, uh, two children, and he would hold them. He actually, in the Atlanta child case, um, gave them to some sexual predators and then killed the kids and then killed the sexual predators. And that's how he would work. He would never allow anybody to have one up on him and know about any killing. Um, There were lots of low-level people below him involved in the occult, but he was the top dog. And uh, he was connected to Charlie Manson. He was in Leavenworth Prison with Charlie Manson, and uh, there's plenty of evidence of that, and I've got a letter sitting here right in front of me where he admits it. Um, He was competing with people like Charlie Manson. He would never let anybody be a better killer than him. So what I mean by that is when any serial killer was in the newspapers over the decades of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and they were getting recognition, you know, their, their murders were in the paper or they were caught, Edwards would make sure to go to wherever that serial killer was caught and create a murder of recognition that would outdo that person and take take it out of the press. And his murders would always be in the press. Um, he was, uh, as, as, as a cult, though, he wasn't a guy that would walk into some building where they're having a cult meeting. He was the, he was the top dog killer, and uh, it was his job as he told me in an interview, um, to know every one of these people. And if you go on my website on uh, July 9th, 1993, on the timeline, you can read the letter I'm referring to, and it will give you a great insight to Ed Edwards. It's actually a three-page letter he sent the FBI in 1993 after killing the little boys in West Memphis, Arkansas. And that letter contained everything needed to figure out who he really was, that he really was the Zodiac killer, and that he really was the killer of the three little boys in uh, West Memphis. It was a puzzle. And uh, that letter I got from his daughter in 2010, and that really showed me what his intelligence level was. He would stand right in front of the FBI, hand them everything to figure out who he was, 
and be able to walk away and they'd never suspect them. Just incredible. Uh, I mean, the, like I said, I think the scarier thing, not just the fact that the guy was a monster, but the, the fact that the, the level of intelligence that this guy uh, shows in, in the way he operated, not just, not just kills, but the way he actually operated and did everything else. And I, I think that the, the idea that he's connected to some sort of you know, occult network or, or cult network, I should say, uh, behind the scenes with other people to help him cover up his murders, I don't think that that's too you know far out of the you know the ordinary. I mean, that would actually explain how he was able to get away with a lot of the stuff. Uh, not so much um, the killing itself, because I can understand if you know if somebody wants to get away with something like that. Okay, but the massive amount of fraud that he committed while killing, because a lot of people say, well, what did Edwards do for a living? He killed. Like he committed fraud with a lot of the murders that he did as well, uh, and was able to benefit from that. Like. One of the killings he did was uh, his own stepson, right? He adopted a guy, uh, a, a kid, and then, you know, I guess when he was of age, got him to go in the military and then brought him back or, you know, ha- helped the kid go AWOL or, or, or whatnot and then killed him and collected an insurance policy on him, right? Yeah, that case actually is the one that ended up getting him the death penalty. The case occurred in 1996, the same year Joan Benet Ramsey was killed. Edwards actually lured a 22-year-old man. It was just a friend of his kids who was, wasn't very smart, actually. Um, asked him if he wanted a place to stay, invited him into his house. He eventually convinced the kid to change his name uh, to Edwards, Danny Boy Edwards, so that uh, Edwards could be the beneficiary on a $250,000 insurance policy that he took out on him. And then he waited two years and then killed the guy behind a cemetery in Troy, Ohio, beheaded him just like he did Joe Manet, um, and then planted his body for a year, hiding it, waiting to collect, and then collected two hundred fifty grand in 1997 and used that m- money to just perpetuate more murder. He would fly all over the country in uh, private jets. Um, he, was, he was incredibly intelligent, always under-assumed identity, and, and was most likely invited in the first-class sections because he was so charming. And you got to figure two hundred and fifty grand in ninety seven was worth a lot more than it is now. So you got more with it back then, and you got to figure if he's done this once, again he's probably part of this much larger network. I mean, it makes you wonder if he ever. A, a lot of times, these people that are connected to these cults, and, and and I'll throw this out, and then we can move on. But a lot of times, the people that are connected to these things on the back end. Um, you know, like Jimmy Savile, right? It comes out now that the guy out in the UK, that guy was a, a, a pedophile, but not only was he a pedophile, but he also helped procure children. I wonder if this guy helped procure kills, like maybe get people for them to use in sacrifices. And that's one of the reasons why they worked with him. And, you know, he was maybe, I'm sure he probably took part in some of the ceremonies themselves, but it, it, it just, you know, all these connections, I, I, I think that's what makes the the fraud possible because i mean you would figure in if he was doing this since he was 11 years old right eventually he would have gotten caught with covering things up or something but if he's engaging and even if he was just killing and not doing the fraud but engaging in the fraud is another aspect where it opens himself up to maybe they're not looking for a serial killer maybe they're looking for a tax cheat or something or whatever or insurance fraud and he gets nailed that way I think he was able to skate through all that because there there had to be somebody helping him at least once in a while along the way. And I think that helps explain when people say to you, well, how the hell could he have done all this and gotten away with all this fraud? You know, John, I think you're out of your mind. You're just you're you're really you're 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 not thinking right on this one, buddy. Uh, And I, I have to say, no, understanding how cults and stuff work and understanding how there's actually more higher ranking people like, you you know, you said there's a lot of lawyers in these things. And he's not you're not kidding when you say that, uh, you know, you have high ranking people, politicians, judges, lawyers, whatever, prosecutors, police, even Uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that knowing that that this would be able to be covered up because perhaps he was important to them until. He was no longer important, and then once you, you know, once they get to a certain age, they lose that protection, right? I mean, they, they, you know, same thing with Jimmy Savile. He's dead and buried, so they can throw him under the bus now. So I just knowing that how cults work, I think that actually helps 
um, booster your case somewhat, especially with the fraud and how he got away with it. And he admitted to you in interviews with you and conversations, whether it was through letters or you talking to him, that he did a lot of this, correct? Yeah, he actually, Edward, made so many confessions over the years um, and published them and, and put them on our website and sent letters to police, you know, for decades that contained actually confessions to murders if they had followed his life. But how Edward would work with getting people to conspire with him was he would pick his victims very uh, patiently and deliberately, and he knew that he would pick somebody and somehow rope that person into a financial uh, game for them or they're going to get drugs, or they're going to get sex, or they're going to get some type of gain by the ruse he's using, and then he would get them to sin, get them to commit to the fraud that he's about to perpetuate. And they don't have any idea that how it's all going to end is with the murder of somebody. And then the murder happens, and then all the people that have been part of the conspiracy are, are sitting in the back going, we're kind of attached to this and we can't say anything. So they don't say anything. And after Edwards was exposed in 2010, he actually contacted the media and went to the media in Wisconsin demanding to be interviewed. And the two hour interviews can be seen on YouTube. And they were really the Zodiac killer standing in front of the world in 2010, trying to tell somebody to come on, look at me, look at who I am. And, uh, that's how he worked. A lot of people saw him and went, oh, my God, it's him. Um, he would always go to police departments whenever he moved and introduce himself to policemen and become their friends so he'd have inside knowledge of all the cases going on in the city. And they didn't know that the real killer was actually part of them. Just incredible. And I'm glad you brought up the Zodiac because that's what that was the next question. Now, I know we covered in the first hour you, you, the, what you've been able to bring to, to light, the connections to uh, Black Dahlia, and uh, we've been talking about the Jean Benet case. And again, ladies and gentlemen, you have to listen to the whole interview if you're just picking up you know, with us now. Uh, you have to get John's book because a radio broadcast you know, is not uh, enough time to do the research on this. You have to really know, you know not only – you know, about, I guess, some killers and how they work and MOs and stuff and, you know, serial killers in general. But you also want, have to know about the occult. You have to read John's book and go to the website. You have to understand there's, there's much more to this. It's like, uh, uh, you know, there's layers to it. There, and you have to peel away each layer. And the, the, each layer that you peel away, you learn more. So go get the book, coldcasecameron.com. And I say that um, because if you don't get the book, then, okay, yeah, it's a good broadcast. It might pique your interest. But if you're really interested in researching this and you want to challenge him and say, well, give me more evidence about Block Dahlia or John Bonet, well, you know, I only have two hours to pick his brain about some of this stuff. So we highlight this stuff. But in his book, it goes into detail. So go over to coldcasecameron.com, get his book. It's me, Edward Wayne Edwards, the serial killer you never heard of. So the Zodiac murders, John. How did you first learn of his connection to the Zodiac murders? Again, I'm sure you used his book um, that he published to, to do this, but how did you first learn of his connection to the Zodiac murders? Well, when he first got exposed in June of 2010, and then I connected him to a Lover's Lane murder here in Great Falls in 1956, well, the, the Zodiac killer was a killer of Lover's Lane couples, people parked on Lover's Lane. They're lying on a beach. She would go up to them and stab them, shoot them, tie them up. Um, and that's what happened in Great Falls in 1956. But another very important thing about the Zodiac killer was that he attacked a couple on September 27, 1969, on Lake Berryessa. And the woman's name was Celia Shepard, and the man's name was uh, Brian Hartnell. And he actually left Brian alive to describe the whole thing as it played out. Although he stabbed Brian, he didn't kill him. He wanted him alive to explain what happened. And what happened in that case is Edwards walks in wearing the executioner's hood and the Zodiac cross and circle on his chest. And he starts conversing with the two on the beach. And he tells them that he had been in Deer Lodge prison, that he had stolen a car, that he had killed a guard, and that he was headed to Mexico. And Edwards had actually been involved in the 1956 Deer Lodge prison riot where the guard was killed. 
And everything he told uh, Brian Hartnell at that beach was what Edwards had done, but he had done it in 1956. And so investigators spent a lot of time on the Zodiac case trying to figure out who might have been in Deer Lodge prison that might be the Zodiac killer. Well, they just didn't go back far enough. And it was 13 years before the Zodiac started that Edwards was in Deer Lodge prison, had participated in the riot, the guard was killed, um, and he was trying to escape. And everything he told them at that point matched. And then, inside of uh, his book that he wrote in 1972, Edwards starts talking about a killer he knew that liked to collect slaves in his afterlife. And that was a, a direct quote out of one of his Zodiac ciphers that had been solved in 1969, and uh, it ended up being that Edwards was the Zodiac Killer, and there's no doubt about it, because my friend Neil, um, who uh, worked with me on this, and he's highly intelligent and knows a lot about the occult, cracked the Zodiac Identity Cipher in July of 19, uh, 2010, and it named Edward Edwards. For those that don't know what the Zodiac Identity Cipher was, it was a 13-character cipher that the Zodiac Killer sent in 1970, uh, actually on the anniversary of the Deer Lodge prison riot, April 20th, 1959 is when the riot was. And those 13 characters ended up being Edward's name in Mirror Image, and uh, Edward Edwards, actually that is 13 characters, the name Edward Edwards. And uh, once we cracked the identity cipher, we confronted Edward by letter and phone call for a year, and he led us on a game of murder. And uh, he was the Zodiac killer, but he kept telling us that uh, we didn't know the whole story. And boy, was he right. Incredible. Just incredible stuff. And again, a two-hour show isn't enough to call, talk about this. you got to get his book. Another set of murders uh, that I, I want to throw out there before I forget to ask you this, because, you know, limited amount of time, I have to squeeze this stuff in there. Um, Adam Walsh. Now, this one is kind of close to home because I live in South Florida. Now, I know the Hollywood police, uh, in, in police lingo, they like two guys for it, and they came out a couple of years ago and said that it's most likely them, and blah, 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 blah. I don't think it was the two guys they blamed. Now, in my research, I came across um, a connection to the dark occult again uh, when it came to his murder, and perhaps it, it could have been uh, a cult of individuals that did it, or it could have been done as part of some sort of ceremony. And then... Here comes your book, you know, years later, and you're saying that a guy who has connections to a cult and was a Satanist killed this, bo- this little boy and decapitated him. Now, whether he did it by himself or, you know, as part of a ceremony or whatever, it's, it's just it, – to me, it's interesting connection. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't quite glue everything together, but it kind of steers you more in the direction of what you're talking about. So the, the murder of Adam Walsh. How were you able to connect Edwards to him? Well, for those dear uh, listeners that don't know who Adam Walsh was, he was the son of John Walsh, America's most wanted host. Um, Adam was kidnapped July 27th, 1981. Actually, he was kidnapped just after Edwards finished the Atlanta child killings, which were just you know, over in Atlanta, Georgia, where he killed 24 little uh, kids there. And so he went to Hollywood, Florida. And he uh, kidnapped Adam Walsh. I had no idea that this case was going to come into this investigation. And uh, what happened was in uh, about the third year of the investigation, after I determined that Edwards had set up those websites regarding the Black Dahlia and all of that, I found that he had been blogging on the Internet for over 15 years against uh, his own cases. And in 2008, the Hollywood, Florida police went public and named Otis Toole as the killer of Adam Walsh. And the two people you were referring to were Henry Lucas and Otis Toole. And that's who the police always tried to peg for Adam Walsh. But uh, Edwards went online on his birthday, June 14th, 2009, just after uh, the police had taken his DNA. And he realized he was going to go down for his first murder in Wisconsin. And he actually confessed to being the killer of Adam Walsh and confessed to being the Zodiac killer, and also uh, told everybody that John Walsh had received uh, Zodiac killer letters back in 1991. <clears throat> and, uh, in fact, John Walsh had received letters signed by Scorpion. 
And uh, those letters actually were written by Edwards in 1991, uh, taunting John Walsh, the host of America's Most Wanted, to catch him, because Edwards was America's Most Wanted. He taunted John Walsh from the time that he killed his son in 1981 all the way up until his death, because Edwards always claimed to be the best criminal ever, and that's what he wanted to go down in, and what he really meant was the best killer ever. And here John Walsh was doing a show on America's Most Wanted. And Edward's confession can be read on my timeline if you go to uh, June 14, 2009. And you can read his confession to killing uh, John Walsh's son, Adam, and it's pretty horrible. But it definitely tied him all together with the killing of Adam Walsh, six years old, Joe Benet Ramsey, six years old, and little six-year-old Suzanne Dickens, six years old in Chicago in 46. He killed kids his whole life, and he killed them at the age that his life was destroyed. Six. So it's very significant. Again, like you said, it goes to his childhood. That went back when his mother was uh, it, it shot, and then he was put in a uh, home. And they changed his name uh, at a young age. You said, and that that I mean that, that's. I guess it's weird to hear that that had a profound effect on him. But I guess as a child. His, I, I, you know, probably being in such a a traumatized state, maybe because of what you know he had been, you know, through up to the age of five, whatever his background was with his parents, and then his mother being killed, um, and then losing his identity. I'm sure. I guess that's that, that is a, a way to start him on a path of, you know, it's like two separate identities almost. And I, I, I maybe maybe he maybe he actually split in his mind, and there really was, you know two different identities or it was just an act but either way you can see that this does goes back to his childhood and the event of his mother's death and then it's amazing how he he metamorphosized i can never get that word out from the time he was five till 11 and turned in from this kid you know five-year-old kid into a killer you know and a a pretty proficient one for an 11 year old i would say uh, at least in my opinion you know the average 11 year old doesn't think like that the fact that if if you're correct and he was Dahlia's killer, he would have been like 13 and a half, 14 years old, you said, around that time. I mean, you'd have to be pretty proficient and, and, and uh, you know, uh, in the mind, knowing how to cut a human body for a 13 year old. I mean, you, you, there would be certain physical limitations to doing that as some of these other killings and dismembering of the bodies, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, he was precision, and uh, he explains that all in detail, how he did it, actually, on org, He actually explains the details of how he cut her up in the bathtub and hauled her out in her own suitcases and uh, stuck her in the back of the trunk in the suitcases, drove to the park, and laid her out right there. Now, he had, he had completely dissected the six-year-old girl just a year earlier, so dissecting the 22-year-old female was the representation of his mother and dissecting a little six-year-old girl that was uh, destroying uh, the little girl at the same age that he was destroyed. And when you look at the identity crisis he had, um, and you look at the Zodiac Killer, the Zodiac Killer teased us his entire life with his identity. And why did he do that? Because he didn't even know who he was. And that's because Edwards was actually born Charles Edward Myers, named after his grandfather. And then his mother... Cecilia Myers is shot suspiciously, lives six days, dies, and they change his name. Why did they change his name? Because grandfather didn't want the little bastard tied to the name. That's, and I really believe that he shot his own mother at age five. The stuff in the orphanage changed his name, and uh, it was an identity crisis, and he was raised in the era of the Cleveland Corso murders. John, I'm going to cut us off. For, I'm going to cut us off because the break's sneaking up. But we, I want to pick up right here on the other side, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be rattling through a bunch of questions here in the last 26 minutes with my guest, John Cameron. Go to his website, Cold Case Cameron. Get his book. I'm going to have him plug everything really quick because he's a whole. Not only does he have a, a website and a book, but he's also got a YouTube channel. And uh, I want you to go to his YouTube channel because, again, it's. Uh, at least like an addendum to the book itself, you can see what videos he's put up. And if there's video evidence, which I'm sure there is, he's got that up there as well. So I'm going to give John the floor and let him plug that. And then we're going to get back into 
uh, you know, the, the, the early childhood, because I know that was one of the questions, was does, does anybody think that uh, Edwards was the one that killed his mother? And I had mentioned that earlier in the first hour. And then we're going to get into, uh, you know, the police looking into this stuff. And we're going to get, I, I have a few questions that have been thrown at me that I have to get asked. But first, go ahead, John, and plug your site, your book, and your YouTube channel, and anything else you want to throw out there really quick. Well, yeah, I'd love people to buy my book. It's me, Edward Wayne Edwards, the serial killer never heard of. Um, I never intended to actually write a book, but I realized that I was a new investigation that had to be released publicly because there really wasn't any law enforcement agency that investigated this man after his capture. And I wanted the people to know the information because there are about a dozen people sitting in prison right now that are innocent on his murders. But if you also go to my website, coldcasecameron.com, there's a timeline of this man's entire life and you can watch the videos and see all the recognition he got throughout his life. He appeared on game shows, um, TV, radio, newspapers everywhere, bragging that he was reformed, and he was killing in these communities while he was bragging. So, yeah, I'd appreciate it. People go to that site and let's get some of these innocent people released. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually an aspect that I don't think a lot of people realize, and you have it listed in the back of the book is the actual amount of people that went to jail, and some have been actually executed for crimes that you've connected Edwards to. And we're going to get into, there's questions about, uh, you know, why he, whether he, um, uh, you know, why he, he admitted to some of the stuff and why some of the information he told you, which we can get into. But I want to focus on that, that early childhood for a second, because that's important. That was one of the questions I know was asked earlier, and I'd mentioned this earlier. Do you think that Edwards killed his mother? And you did say when we were going into break that you do think that he might have been responsible for her murder as well, the shooting. When he, and that means that if, if that's true, then he would have been five when he did his first murder, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. And the importance of that, the date of that killing, August uh, 2nd, 1938, she lived until August 8th. The funeral was August 10th. He uh, had committed completely ritualistic killings on those dates. And if you look at the, the killings he actually confessed to in 2010, they occurred on the date of the death of his mother. And that's what he was. He was ritualistic. If you look at Adam Walsh, his head was placed August 10th, 1981, to be found. And that was the day of his mother's funeral. Uh, Edwards was ritualistic like that. And he would uh, kill and place bodies um, Christmas, uh, April 1st, his mother's birthday, August, his mother's death, Easter, July 4th, Memorial Day, any type of holiday, Christian holiday. He was raised so horribly from the very beginning. Um, between 1933 and 38 in Cleveland, Ohio, where he was raised, a serial killer was loose called the Cleveland Torso Murder. And what that person was doing was cutting up individuals in pieces and laying them out in public. And this is Ed's first five formative years. This is all over the papers in Cleveland. There was well over a dozen people killed and cut up. And that's what he would mimic in his first murders when he cut up the little girl in the basement and then cut up the black guy and laid it out in the public park. He, uh, you know, he laid out, he did what he was exposed to um, from birth until the time he escaped Carbondale or Orphanage. He was just completely destroyed destroyed spiritually and physically, mentally. And, you know, that can be traumatic enough to fracture somebody's mind. Uh, and, um, you know, the Nazis perfected uh, what they called trauma-based mind control. Uh, and, again, this goes into something that I've talked about. I'm not saying he was mind control, but the they understand that a, a large trauma can cause someone's mind to fracture like that so it makes you wonder if there was actually another personality that was created inside of his mind that was this killer you know not saying that he didn't know about it but that's actually perhaps this second personality took over uh you know because that happens as a defense mechanism and perhaps you know this inner evil you know came out i, I don't know if that's if that's true or not i don't know if he was ever psychologically uh, examined. I would assume that they, they had a psychological examination done of him. What was the, if so, what was the outcome of that? I recovered uh, his 1956 psychological evaluation that was done in Deer Lodge Prison, and it sure showed that he was a sadomasochist, um, 
psychopath, deep hatred for women, and had been kidnapping women his, his whole life and getting away with it because he was so good at, at the talk. He'd get arrested repeatedly, but then be able to, not for murder, but for other crimes, burglary, robbery, forgery, and then talk his way out by supplying them information on a murder he committed and steer it to an innocent guy and give them the information that would lead to them, and he'd get out. And that started actually in Florida in 1951 when he was uh, 17 years old, and he uh, went AWOL from the Marines. For a year, he was out killing and got caught, but they didn't know it. And uh, they gave him a deal, and they released him. Uh, even though he went AWOL from the Marines, they released him, and he ran again for two more years killing and got caught again for a robbery, but they didn't know he was killing, and uh, he talked his way out again. And this was his history all his life. He would get arrested for robbery, burglaries, other sins, and uh, talk his way out of prison. He was a very smooth guy. That's why I say I think that, you know, as he got older, his IQ had to have been higher because not only was he, you know, do you have this level of intelligent thinking, but at the same time, you're able to pull off charm on top of it. Not, not everybody that's smart and intelligent can pull off uh, being personable. Sometimes they come off as cold and robotic or uh, like condescending pricks almost. And in order to get away with a lot of the stuff that he did get away with and get out of things, he would have had to have been a smooth operator. And that's how, you know, it almost was like getting with his prey, too. You know, like the, the, he lured them in. They didn't realize he was a spider until it was too late. Yeah, he had a certain uh, punch. He called it the rabbit punch. And it was a punch to the throat that breaks the hyoid bone. And that meant that he had gotten that close to his victims and they were unsuspecting of him. And that would be his signature uh, punch. And a lot of the victims would have a broken hyoid bone. And what that means is that Edward groomed his way right into their life, was probably sitting there talking to him like the nicest person in the world, and then all of a sudden, whack. He had demonstrated in that video on YouTube in June of 2010 on my website. And uh, it, it basically leaves the victim alive, unable to breathe, but having to live through the horror he's about to do to you. That's so sick and twisted. I mean, the, the, the fact that you know how to immobilize somebody, um, but not enough to kill them. To where they won't feel what you're about to do to them, just enough to you know to immobilize. It's ugh. I mean, eh, how many people think of that during the course of the day, as opposed to, you know, like you get up in the morning, you're like, I have to go to work, I have to pay my car payment today. You know, maybe go to the post office, maybe go food shopping. Meanwhile, this guy's thinking of how to, he can incapacitate somebody, but yet not do so where it's completely fatal. Uh, at least long enough anyway to the point where they're going to be alive in the next few minutes while he does other just horrific things to them. I mean, it's just, it's horrific to think about on so many levels. Uh, I mean, I, I'm researching serial killers over the course of time. Again, I, I understand monsters. I understand, you know, the ghouls. I get them. But this guy is, this guy is a different level. I think he's above them. You know, as a, as a detective... Would you say that he's probably one of the smartest, if not the smartest, killer that you've come across in your you know, research and in uh, your time as a cold case detective? You know, when I first started this, uh, I got the sense that this was not going to be normal. Just the whole way it was evolving. All you had to do was follow the evidence he laid. But yeah, he... Um, he had an evil that was beyond anything I'd ever dealt with. And uh, there was a period of time when my friend Neil and I were questioning him and, and writing letters back and forth that we had opened up Pandora's box and we knew there was no clothes in it. And we had no idea who he had connections to. But uh, he is the most evil person that I have ever dealt with in my whole life. And yet I felt like I could have talked to him for days and months just because of the incredible intelligence level. Uh, as an investigator, that's what you look at. Yeah, that's, that's one of the alarm bells that, that went off with me, was just uh, the level of intelligence this guy had. 
not even so much the her, the the horror of what he did, but I mean, like I, uh, maybe I'm numb to it a little bit, but like I've I'm able to look past that and see something deeper. And I mean, this guy I think is above many of these other prolific killers. Uh, and if if we can connect him with evidence to these murders, that's even more important. And that's my next question is. Um, I know that you've, you know, researching this over the course of time, you've you've bumped into some police departments that don't want to, you know, even though you're a fellow officer, you know, they don't want to deal with it. And I've seen that before. That they don't want to reinvestigate their cases and stuff for for you know numerous reasons. M- maybe some of them could be involved, you know, at a, at a deeper level. Like we we're talking about the cults before. Who knows? But the point is, you've been. You know, and you've you've had people that are also willing to help too. But you, I'm sure you've run into some flack with many of these police agencies, and I know, in fact, I know you have with some of them. But since you did the coast to coast interview, now it's like a two part question. Since you you did the coast to coast interview, um, I know you've you've uh, been reached out or reached, you know, like emailed by uh, other police departments, and you have gone around and spoken to some. So first. Why do you think that they, you know, they they haven't looked into these crimes? And since you did the coast to coast interview and you got the book out there and people have heard it, do you think that some of those people that were against it uh, w- w- might end up changing their minds and realizing that there is more evidence to back up what you're talking about, or do you think that they're still going to be, you know, stalwart in their beliefs and stick to their guns? Well, I think they'll probably stick to their guns and, and nobody will investigate a lot of these things. But uh, that's why I wrote the book, because then it'll be out there in the public and uh, it'll be out there forever and people can make their own decisions as to whether or not this man was capable of doing all this. But Edwards was a very hard person <coughs> to wrap. Uh, people couldn't wrap their minds around a guy like this. Um, I could because I ended up kind of befriending him and had a lot of, you know, contact with him by letter, which was very important because he was a writer. And I knew that at the beginning that I needed his writing. Um, Edwards always planted DNA at his cases. So a lot of the murders that are sitting out there unsolved have DNA just sitting out there, and police departments don't investigate. They just check the DNA. And uh, in this case, in Great Falls in 1956, they supposedly recovered some DNA in 2002 and uh, didn't match Edwards. But it's because he planted ev- uh, evidence at every one of his scenes and actually admitted all this. Um, would leave hair, question the hands of some of his victims, would leave blood, semen, saliva, fiber, patterns, blood patterns. That way it would never, never direct to him. It makes investigations very difficult. You have to do the work to catch a guy like Ed Edwards. And he had put it all out there to be caught, but you had to really follow his life and... Uh, and do the work. Again, you you know you can't listen to a two hour radio show and uh, you know go oh well I I think the guy did it or no I think the I think John Cameron is full of it. Uh, you have to do the research and and again I mean even if you're only able to forensically or whatever you know through the system connect him to half of the the murders that you say that he's connected to. Wow, I mean how many you know open cases could you close? How much closure could you finally bring to many of these cases? Uh, and, you know, it just, it's chilling to even think about it. I think it's, it's so deep that either people, either people think it's, it, it there's no way uh, that it, it could be reality or perhaps maybe they don't want to admit to a mistake but I think, in, in honestly, I think one of the the because I I've seen this myself. I think one of the first biggest speed bumps in the 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 research of this is people saying, "Well, come on, there's all these different murders. It's all the you know blah 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 blah." But if you understand again that his mo, see, I didn't understand that either until I thought about it, and I was like, "Well, his mo," and you even you said this, his mo wasn't so much the killing itself. It was the killing was part of the the much bigger mo. Like his was much different. That's why I say that if 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 you're, I mean, if if you are correct, John, this guy is this guy is different than any other. Uh, you know, he he's uh he's like the next evolution of serial killer. It's kind of scary. Uh, the the way that he was operating mentally, and, and I hope that the police agencies uh, take you seriously. Now we got about ten minutes left. I have, as you know, uh, a, a couple other questions about the evidence and stuff. But 
since the interview, have you been contacted by any police agencies out there to give you more information to back up what you've been talking about and, and maybe give you some more um, positive links to, with Edwards to some of these murders or other murders that you maybe even didn't know about? Yeah, it actually has been radio that has been the, the word out. That's the only media that has covered this story. Um, the, the major media has not covered it, and, and it's exactly because when I would call them, you know, during the investigation, I would call media agencies for information. I would call police and tell them I have this, 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 and the first reaction was, you're nuts, and shut you off. Um, that's always been the reaction to this, and I know it's still the reaction to some people, but when they heard me on the radio, then it's different because it hits home to a lot of places. You did kill in every state, and there will be killings everywhere. And uh, in, on the Coast to Coast interview and also on the Hagman and Hagman interview, um, I ended up getting phone calls from uh, policemen out east, Pennsylvania, Florida, um, North Carolina, uh, tying murders to Edwards just because of the information I was giving. And it really opened up a period of time that I didn't know what he was doing, and that was 1996 to 1999. And those years were so important, but I never, I didn't have a lot of information on my timeline as to what he was doing after he killed Joe Benet in '96. But those interviews opened up what he was doing, and he was killing in Pennsylvania just repeatedly, and he was blogging on Google Blog, and I didn't know this. And uh, he actually set up an entire site of all his murders, blogging against uh, people trying to challenge him. And many of the bloggers thought that the guy they were confronting on this site was the real killer, and they were right. It was. And that Coast to Coast interview and Hagman and Hagman interview opened that up, and uh, it's opened up a whole other book, actually, that's going to have to be put out about what's come about since the release of the book. That's awesome, like an addendum to it. Uh, and, I mean, I encourage you, put it together, please. Uh, when you do, I'll, I'll bring you on again, and we'll we'll chat about it because this is a um, this is a subject. Uh, again, two hours doesn't do it justice. And in fact, uh, I'm interested. In, we'll chat about this off air. But I mean, I would love to pick your brain about other serial killers too. Uh, you know, obviously, you're a seasoned investigator, a, a cold case detective, and you know what you're talking about. I would I would love to have you back on to pick your brain about other investigations as well. We could still plug the book too, but. Um, since we got about uh, seven minutes left, I want to—I I have a couple other questions that I've been uh, asked to ask you by people submitting them to me, and one of them is this: uh, it's, I, it, there's a couple of them, but I'll, this one's the the number one asked question. So, and that would be, and it's a two-parter. Um, first, what kind of evidence, you know, for someone that's on the fence? Okay, really, I I, I don't think that he's connected to all this stuff. What kind of evidence um, could you say uh, that – I know there's more on the site, but you know, what, what could you throw out there right off the bat to try to convince them uh, that he is connected to some of these murders, uh, perhaps you know, um, conversations with him, uh, things he might have admitted? And the second part of that question is, and I'm sure you get this a lot, if he did admit to this stuff to you, then – do you think that if, if your um, analysis of him is correct, where he wanted attention, do you think he's just admitting to connections to some of these murders just for that so he gets recognition because he knows he's getting older? And perhaps he knows he's getting close to his, you know, his mortal end here in this world. So do you think maybe he could have just been lying and, and trying to connect dots that weren't there? Edward lied his whole life, so everything he said was a lie, and he told me that repeatedly. But this is different regarding what he wanted. He was a writer, a publisher, and he wanted recognition, and what he wanted was to put it all out there as a puzzle. Because he always felt he was smarter than every cop, every prosecutor, anybody that came around. But he also knew that in the end, when it was discovered who he really was, and he actually didn't think it was going to happen until 2058 is what he actually had blogged at one point. Um, he didn't think anybody would put it together. But being in Deer Lodge Prison, I just happened to be in the right position where he had been in 1956 that opened up the records that tied him to all the cases. Um, no, he didn't lie about any of them. And I can say that 
pretty confidently because I wouldn't have followed this goose chase uh, if it wasn't true, and it's he laid it all out there to be true. And all you had to do was the work. I just had a group of people that were in the right position with a lot of help, and uh, we have it all. And uh, he's definitely the Zodiac killer, and there's no doubt about that, and he basically was portraying himself as Satan. Uh, he wanted to go down in history as a Egypt, ancient Egyptian god, like that people will be talking about this guy at Edwards a thousand years from now, and what did he do? That was the purpose of it, and that's why he didn't stand up and proclaim on the Zodiac. He had actually been doing it his whole life and written publications, and nobody would listen. Do you think uh, that over the course of time, maybe perhaps investigators taking um, a lead from your book because uh, I'm that's why I'm glad you wrote the book because it's almost like you've taken all this evidence that you had and instead of trying to talk to somebody about it and it kind of sounds scatterbrained to them you can give them this book and say read this here's the website as an addendum to it do the research yourself do you foresee as an investigator as a seasoned cold case detective do you foresee your fellow compatriots in the law enforcement community taking this seriously and perhaps solving some of these murders and being able to finally, you know, with maybe DNA evidence or, or some sort of concrete evidence, being able to nail him on the books for a lot of these murders? Yeah, I do. It's going to take a long time to unravel, though. It took 66 years to create, if you think about it. Every waking moment of his life was thought about killing somebody, setting someone up and also taunting the police with false letters and everything else. So yeah, I knew it would be a long time. I didn't think it was going to be this long, but now that I've been in it this long, I realize that it'll be three or four more years, I think, before the, the actual, what he actually did comes out. Um, but yeah, they'll be forced to. Uh, there's a lot of people sitting in prison right now, and the police have the evidence. They have the letters. The newspapers have the letters that Edward spent. There's a lot of letters that Edward sent that were never divulged, and those letters were the answer. It was always about the writing. The The last question we have time for, because we have about three minutes left, is, is the all the evidence that y- you have compiled you know, to connect him to these killings, is it, again, from a seasoned cold case detective standpoint, looking you know how you could build a case through the legal system, get prosecutors to take it seriously, is it all just circumstantial, or is there more to it? Is there enough evidence, uh, perhaps being able to link him? Do they, yeah, I'm sure they have a DNA sample still of him somewhere on file. Is there evidence maybe to compare to an old sample of his to see if they could connect him to any of these other murders? Yeah, he's actually in the DNA coda, uh, CODIS data bank. But because he planted evidence, you know, you can't just check the DNA. Um, but what you can do is you can take your old evidence in your cases and send it in and see if he left evidence because in the old days he was leaving skin cells and stuff like that and we can now do skin cell DNA. But um, you really do have to do the investigation on that. You just can't run his DNA. You have to look into what what the case, what transpired in the case because they all stand out. They are always had a satanic connection. They were usually anonymous phone calls and letters and all of them. And the... Uh, it's actually the wounds on the victim's bodies and things uh, actually tied to ritualism and satanic occults also. So there's a lot of things you have to look at. And uh, my book basically is just 400-some uh, pages of a summary of the investigation, but I have hundreds, if not a million pages of the documentation on this guy and what he put out over the years. Um, and that's kind of what I'm got the website for, and I'm, I'm slowly getting all my documents in there, but I've got thousands and thousands of pages that I'll be putting on there for people to read, PDF files of Edwards testifying in trials and things like that. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested to see what comes of this, uh, you know, and in the long term, you know, four or five years from now, if you'll see on the news out of nowhere one day, John Cameron, cold case detective John Cameron, solves, you know, you know, old murder, Black Dahlia murder solved, whatever, uh, you know, John Benet Ramsey murder solved, you know, whatever. It, it, it would be interesting to see if uh, in four or five years it actually comes out. Or, uh, I mean, if he is connected to some of these uh, deeper, darker cults, then maybe it won't. Who knows? But hopefully, hopefully uh, there will be some good law enforcement officers out there that will pick up the ball and run with it. John, we are out of time. 
thank you so much for coming on, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it too. Uh, it's it's been an honor, and uh, like I said, I'll chat with you off air about coming back on. So stay right there, ladies and gentlemen. We are out of time. Check it out. I urge you to always do the research yourself. This is Sparta! Coldcasecameron.com, coldcasecameron.com. The book is titled It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, the serial killer you never heard of. We are out of time. As I always tell you the solutions to our problems are an inside job. Do your research. I love you all. I'll catch you all again live next week. I am out of here. <laughs>